Let me start off by just saying that, that for a long time, I've worked on uh, the economics of markets and, and what's called market microstructure. And of course, the flash crash uh, provides an interesting laboratory to, to think about these issues. I should also start by saying Greg Bourbon of the SEC has warned in a number of speeches about uh, theorizing about the flash crash with data. I agree, but that's precisely what I'm going to do. We don't yet actually have the data that we'd like. Um, I'm going to present you with a picture that's probably familiar. Um, this is from May 6, 2010, the date of the flash crash. And, and uh, you know, things start going down, and then they plummet. Um, you know, here to here is about 5 or 6 percent. Um, here to here is about 9 percent. And then uh, uh, in a matter of minutes, it's back up to uh, the, the levels there. Um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, one of the things I discovered in, in, in preparing for this talk that I hadn't noticed before is that sometimes the flash crash starts at, uh, uh, at about uh, 1, 1 to 1.30 and ends at about 3, and sometimes it starts at 2 to 2.30 and ends at 4. Well, that's because the futures markets are measuring time in central standard time, or central daylight time, and the equity markets are measuring in eastern time. Um, just something to watch out for. Uh, the, uh, uh, here's a picture with, with volume placed on there and a, a big message from this, and this is noted in the CFTC SEC joint report on the flash crash, is volume and liquidity are not the same thing. Volume was huge as these prices were dropped, but standard measures of liquidity just blew out. We had wide spreads between the bid and the offer. We had very few shares being offered, being uh, provided at the bid and the offer. So that's sort of the the the, the, the facts in a picture. Um, and, and here's sort of the narrative. I wanted to start with it's a dark and stormy night, but it wasn't. Uh, it was a stormy morning. And it was started out, guess what, with news about the European debt situation. <laughs> it just always stays the same. Um, and then there was a, lar a large seller came in at, at 1.30. This is, again, uh, Central Daylight Time. And uh, uh, they were, they were it, it, I'll talk a little bit more about the nature of the cell program, but the cell program wanted to maintain a constant proportion of volume. The algorithm looked at the previous minute's trading, looked at the volume in the previous minute, and said, okay, in the next minute, we want to be 9% uh, of that volume. We had high-frequency traders, uh, and of course, uh, much of my talk is going to concern high-frequency traders. Um, they were buying and then selling and then they s and then they s and they sold and they sold and then they sold into the cash market. No surprise there. I mean, if the if the E mini contract is is diving and you see opportunities to hedge in the cash market or you see opportunities to make an arbitrage profit by selling in the cash market, that will, that's what you'll do. Um, and then there was sort of a hot potato phase um, that, that was as described in the CFTC SEC joint report where sort of these high frequency traders were just passing these futures contracts on the round among themselves. We hit 145 and 28 seconds and mechanically the, the CME stops trading in the E-mini the e contract. Uh, just in case you don't know, the E-mini contract is the futures contract for the S&P 500. Um, <coughs> five second pause. Uh, and in fact, uh, that was rather effective. The price is stabilized. Um, in the words of the, of the CFTC, fundamental traders came in. That is, they saw these ridiculously low prices and said, yeah, we'll buy at that price. And they did. And by 1408, the price was back up to the 130 uh, level. So that was sort of the story on, on, on the CME. What was happening in stocks? Well, I told you that the, the uh, the price pressure, if you will, in the, in the futures market was being translated into the cash market, as you would expect it to do. Though some interesting things happened, and I think they have important economic consequences. Um, the E-mini crash, as I pointed out, st stopped at about 2.45. Now we're at uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, sell orders to each of the individual S&P 500 companies continued, um, and, and in the S&P 500 in various ETFs, including, of course, the Spider, which is the ETF that represents the S&P 500. But the fact is, is actual quotations and transactions had been slowed down by message traffic uh, in, in the equity markets. 
Market makers backed away from the cash markets, uh, leading to trades at the sub quotes. There were famous transactions at a penny and at $100,000. Um, that they backed away from, cash th th from the cash markets, this is basically anecdotal evidence. We don't actually have full information about what high frequency traders or market makers were doing at the time. Uh, but this, this came about from SEC interviews with market participants. Um, by 3 o'clock, uh, most stocks were close to their 2 o'clock levels. Um, there were a number of transactions in the 2.40 to 3 o'clock range that were at absurd prices, including these pennies and 100,000. Um, and FINRA and the exchanges agreed to, to break such trades. So that's sort of the narrative that accompanies the picture. Now, uh, where, where does all, you know, how do we explain all this? Um, well, here's, here's where my theorizing comes in. Uh, again, without data, because we don't have it. Though we will have, the SEC has developed a mechanism for getting some of it, we hope. Um, okay, so first of all, they're called high frequency traders. They actually don't necessarily trade at such a high frequency, but they certainly quote at a high frequency. And that's an important characterization that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, they are, I, I mean, I think the way I think about them is as natural sort of market makers. They are not designated market makers. They're not like the old market makers that were on NASDAQ, uh, but rather they are unofficial market makers. They are standing ready to buy at the bid price and sell at the offer price. They provide, as we say, liquidity. Okay, now, so let me backtrack a little bit and talk about the economics of this business being a market maker. So what is the business? You hope to make a penny or two on every uh, two transactions where you buy at the bid and you sell at the offer. And, and very often, you hope all the time, the offer is above the bid. And so you make this guaranteed uh, uh, profit. It is not guaranteed, however. There are costs to being a market maker. There are you know, simply opportunity costs. I mean, if you weren't a market maker, you could at least be a garbage man. So you know, you've got to get compensated for that. There are risk costs. Uh, if you build up an inventory and then the prices move against you, uh, that can be very costly. And, and so you're risk averse. You don't like that to happen. A major cost, however, that may not leap out immediately is that actually when you're making a market, you're providing quotes to everyone. And you can't tell who you're going to trade with very frequently, it could be. You're going to be trading with people who have better information than you do. You know what? If you trade with people who have better information, you're going to lose. OK, so what is the story here? Well, um, suppose we have an informed market maker doesn't know that. But suppose, uh, as, as an all-knowing uh, external viewer, you know that there's an informed buyer coming in. Um, What's going to happen? Well, if, if that informed buyer is informed and chose to buy, it means that that informed person knows that the price is going to go up. Well, so you sold to this person at the offer, the ask price. But now, what does it mean that this, the prices are going to go up? It means you are going to hope to close out that position at a lower bid. But in fact, the bid will be higher because this informed person bought from you. Okay. Well, you recognize that that can happen. You take care of that by quoting a wider spread. You compensate uh, by, for losing money to uh, inform people by making money from other people who don't have information by quoting a higher spread. You're buying lower and you're selling higher. Okay. Well, so the fundamental economics says that the more information differences there are out there between those who are making a market, providing liquidity, and those who are trading, the wider are going to be the spreads. Well, so I just said that. You know, the width of the, the, the spread, then, betw again, between the bid and offer is going to be a function of how much information, potentially, how much information there is difference there is between those who are trading against the quotes and those who are providing the quotes. The goal then of high frequency traders who, who want to make money from this market making effort is to try and maximize the amount of information they have, thereby minimizing 
the informational difference between those they're trading with and themselves. So that's what their algorithms are designed to do. What's the information that's available to them? It's basically order flow, quote, and transaction information. That's the information they have. Importantly, they have information not just in, suppose we're focusing on providing the quotes in IBM, they have not only information about uh, uh, transactions and quotes in IBM, they also have information about quotes and transactions in all the other stocks. They have an integrated model of how transactions in other stocks should affect their valuation of, for example, IBM, and those are incorporated in the algorithm. That tells the algorithm how the quotes should be changed in response to new information. As a consequence of all of this, the ability to respond to the information very quickly via low latency, the ability to, uh, to put in quotes and uh, uh, cancel quotes and change quotes very rapidly uh, means that they can quote a tighter spread. So how do they use this order flow information? Well, first of all, of course, it, there can be directional information. Uh, you know, on May 6th, of course, people in the equity markets are watching what's going on in the e-mini market. They're tied into that as well. And what are they seeing? They're seeing a, uh, a huge, uh, apparently, lots of selling pressure. That tells them something about uh, perhaps how people are perceiving the macro economy. They have a model then of that, how that might affect how that should be affecting their quotes in IBM. It's also telling them something about the aggressiveness of uh, that trading, which they translate into then a measure of how much informed trade is there out there. How should they uh, not, only, how, not only directionally how should they move their spread, but how sh they should widen or tighten the spread, decrease the bid and increase the offer uh, to widen the spread. Now, if you look at these kinds of models, it's actually um, conceivable, and we think we see it in the data, that these informational differences can actually lead to a market breakdown. And the logic goes something like this. Market breakdown means you just shut down the market. OK, so here's the problem. We're starting out with a particularly quoted spread between the bid and the offer. And now the market maker gets information that suggests there's a bigger informational problem out there and actually in, inform people. We don't know whether they're buying or selling. If we knew, then we would be informed. But we don't. But we think that there's a lot of people out there that, that could be taking extreme positions, would be willing to trade at extreme prices. We widen the spread, but then we think to ourselves, oh, but if I widen the spread, that means those uninformed people that I would like to be making money from are going to be less likely to trade, right? If it costs you more to buy, and you receive less if you sell, you're going to do less trading. But that means more of the order flow is potentially contained with informed traders, which means, makes you even more nervous. And so you subsequently increase the offer and decrease the bid. But that makes it even more likely that uninformed people will stay away. And in the end, you say, just forget it. I'm out of here. So what do you do? You stop quoting. Well, actually, as a, quote, as a practical matter, what we saw were stub quotes of a penny. Yeah, you're willing to buy at a penny, and you're willing to sell at $100,000. Uh, but no one should be transacting with you. OK, so back to May 6th. Um, so we started out with an apparently very large sell program. Starts in the e-mini. I say apparently because, of course, when the pr sell program starts, no one can know what's going to be happening. It's, uh, uh, I already described, it's supposed to be 9% of the previous minute's volume. Well, that means each minute they add to volume, which means the subsequent minute it's going to be even larger. That's actually, that natural escalation is not a big deal if you do the calculations. Apparently, there was no limit price attached. That is, they, they just wanted to sell, and they really didn't care at what price they sold. And so they could have been selling at very, very low prices indeed. So market makers on the, in the E-mini pit are thinking what? The first thing, 
Who could have private information that would be so important about the macro economy, which of course is basically what the E-mini is measuring. But then they say, on the other hand, who would be so crazy as to put in such an aggressive sell order if they didn't know anything? I don't know what's going on, but I'm nervous you widen out the spread. Okay. Now, in fact, they played. They did buy and then immediately sold. Um, and, uh, and then sold aggressively in the cash markets. Uh, that increase in the volume, and this is the hot potato effect, of course increases the amount of shares that the sell program is selling, which are making them even more nervous because they're saying, now this guy's really wacko, unless he knows something. And so I'm really nervous. Okay, um, so what happened in the, in the listed stocks? The algo algorithms are seeing very aggressive sell orders. Um, they're seeing a flood of orders, order changes, cancellations. Now what you have to know is a little bit about how information is, is uh, 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 tracked on, in the equity markets. There are two systems. There's a CTS, Consolidated Trade System, and the CQS, Consolidated Quote System. And they operate independently and they're fed together to get the consolidated trades and quotes. You have a massive number of quotes and cancellations, which means uh, uh, the quote uh, information is delayed. Transactions are not, however. So what the algorithms are doing is seeing trades that have apparently no quotes associated with them because the quotes that actually led to the trades are not being reflected in the system and they go, whoa, what's going on? So they shut it down. They just, they just back away from providing liquidity. CME calms down, but of course we've had these delays in trades and quotes um, and so the, it takes a while for the equity markets to close down. Okay. Now if you look at the, the CFTC analysis, uh, high frequency traders were not responsible. They did what they usually did. That is, they provided liquidity some of the time, they took liquidity some of the time, and they basically their behavior was not different on the six. It appears to have been dif different on the equity markets where these liquidity providers in fact did withdraw. What seems to be different? What seems to be different was the ability of the information processing uh, of the quotes and trades to handle all the information that was needed by the algorithms to stay confident that they could provide liquidity profitably. Okay, my story true? Uh, I think it's consistent, but I don't know that it is the whole story. And what we really don't have is the data to do this. So what is the SEC also was concerned about not having the information. So they have a Rule 13H that's been adopted in July, which says we want to know who these big traders, who these high frequency traders are. So we are able to look at the data to try and figure out what's going on. More aggressively, the SEC uh, wants to add a Rule 613 that will provide for a uh, consolidated audit trail that will provide the information not, not only on trades and quote, trades, but trades and quotes as well. They also want to know who's doing the trading. Um, and perhaps I should stop at about now? Okay. Um, just a brief reason for the rule change about clearing in the U.S. Clearing is at the brokerage level, which means though the SEC can get information about individuals, it needs to approach the brokers, ask for the information, and the brokers agree to provide the information. So a lesson, <laughs> personal lesson, if you're trading in these markets and you don't know what's going on, use a limit order. You could trade at a very disadvantageous price and uh, uh, not have that trade broken. Speculation, um, I call your attention to this company, Nanex. They actually see, they place a lot more importance on this flow of quotes, and they say, we have to increase the capacity. They've also suggested that they think it might be the basis for some manipulation, but that's a tale for another time. So I will end right there.